This video will introduce you to HTML and HTML5. So what is HTML? Well, HTML stands for Hypertext Markup Language. HTML is the language that your web browsers use to communicate to you what a particular web page looks like. Just like learning any new language, be it Spanish, Chinese, or even English, there is a lot of memorizing as well as learning some basic standards like what a noun is and how it's used properly in a sentence. Well, the same holds true for learning HTML. Instead of nouns and verbs, there are tags and other elements that your web browser uses to put that YouTube video on your computer screen, or those words with bold type or red color on that web page. All these cool things are because of a certain element or tag that makes up HTML coding. Now, there are loads of other languages like jQuery or JavaScript or PHP that also add a lot of additional cool features to your websites, but they all are laying on top of a foundation of HTML. So what is HTML5? Well, HTML5 is the newest version of HTML, and it has many improvements over its prior versions. Many of the basics of HTML remain with HTML5, but there are a few differences between HTML5 and the older versions of HTML. Like, for example, the code is cleaner and, for the most part, easier for today's browsers to read and interpret. Some of the old tags have been dropped and the newer code is built to more easily work with the new, more advanced devices like your cell phones and tablets and, heck, even your refrigerator. Now, a couple of the new tags in HTML5 are video and audio. Now, there's a bunch more tags as well, but these are two I'm just mentioning right now. One of the ways that I learned about the different HTML tags was simply looking at the code on other people's web pages. Anytime you want to see the tags or coding that makes a website do what it's doing in your browser, just use your computer mouse and right click, then select View Page Source, and there you go. At first, it might look overwhelming like the first time you saw a foreign newspaper. You may recognize some things, but most looks like just a bunch of gibberish. The more you learn about HTML, the more you will begin to recognize what most of that gibberish is and what it does. Then you will be able to use those same tags and elements to craft your own web pages. Now here are a few websites for you to bookmark to learn even more about what makes a website do what it does. Now, of course there's plenty more besides just these, but these will get you started. This first one is called HTMLdog.com. There's loads of information here and tutorials on both HTML and CSS, and this is updated as the version of HTML is updated as well. So just because you don't see an HTML5 slapped all over the place does not mean this is old stuff. As a matter of fact, if we scroll down here, come on over to HTML tags, and come on down to the very bottom here, where it says bad tags. This will give you an idea as to some of the old, what's called deprecated tags that don't play nice with other code. Now, some of these tags may still work, but they might play havoc with some of the newer coding, so you want to avoid these as much as possible. Another page is W3 Schools, and like with HTML Dog, there's plenty of tutorials here as well. And one of the things I wanted to mention too in the construction of an HTML document is that you got this declaration at the very top of the page, and this tells the browser that this is not a text document or it's not a Word document or it's not a spreadsheet document, this is in fact an HTML5 document. And if we scroll down here even more, I believe anyway, and here it gives you a little history of some of the older versions, but that's not what I'm talking about right here, it's what I'm talking about. The common declarations for HTML5, it's what I just showed you. For the prior version, HTML4, it's got this declaration right here. And this is what you're going to see in most web pages today. But that's that. So again, add this to your bookmarks. Another one, and I refer to these on several occasions whenever I'm trying to figure out what a particular element does or how I can get it to do what I want it to do on my website. But this is w3.org. And like with HTML Dog, there's nothing on here that's screaming HTML5, but it is up to date. As you can see right here, the declaration they're using here is for HTML5. Give you a little bit of a history background here and all kinds of tutorials and cool stuff all over the place here. And last but not least, my friend, 
Wikipedia. Now, on Wikipedia, there's a lot of additional information too. This is just the HTML page. You can do a search here for HTML5, and we've got a specific page just for HTML5. And if we scroll down here a little bit, you can see right here that you can get additional information on specific elements of HTML5, like the HTML5 for video, which I believe is right here, and also for audio and for Canvas. If we just go to video as a demonstration, HTML5 for video. And this gives you a bit more information on some of the pros and cons of using HTML5 video tags right now in the current state of the browsers not agreeing with one another on a standard format. And there's ways you can work around it here. Like learning a foreign language, the more you practice, the better and quicker you're going to get. That will bring to an end this video on the introduction to Hypertext Markup Language, also known as HTML. Thanks for watching, and you have a great day. Every web page on the old interweb uses a language to communicate with the various browsers in order for us to see the formatted text, or the images, or the colors in the background, or the videos. This language is called HTML. HTML5 is the most recent version of HTML, but when speaking about HTML, you rarely hear the term HTML5. Well, like, for example, you would hear, it's baseball season, but not, it's baseball season 2014. It's kind of implied that it's the most recent version baseball season, and HTML. The HTML language has certain rules for communicating called syntax. This syntax is the code that contains the brackets and words that the browsers interpret into the goodies that we see when we click onto a website. In this video, we're going to create a basic web page using this syntax to demonstrate the use of tags and how they help us make a basic web page. Now there are a few must-haves in order for a browser to decipher the HTML code or syntax and present it to us the way that we are used to seeing a web page, you know, like the text and the images and all the formatting stuff in place. Now actually, there are what I call the Fab Five must-haves. Okay, I'm not really sure just how fabulous these are, but I couldn't think of anything else that made it easy to remember. First, we have the declaration. This is what tells the browsers, hey, this is a version of HTML and not just some text document. Then we have the tags, the HTML, the head, the title, and the body. In most cases, tags will come in pairs, an opening tag and a closing tag. But like most languages, there's always some exception to that rule. More on that here in just a bit. So let's go ahead and roll up our sleeves and make us a web page. Now we're going to need a couple of items to create our web page. A simple text editor to create the page, and I'm going to be using Notepad, and a browser to read it or show it to us. Now first we need to organize, make a work folder that will house all of our files, images, videos, and anything else that we're going to be using in our web page or web pages. Now don't worry about getting everything in there right now, but at least make the folder right now so as we find or make stuff, we'll have a place to put it. Okay, so let me go ahead and open up my folder here. I've already taken the liberty of creating a working folder on my desktop, and inside of that working folder, I've got another folder titled Images and another one titled Backup. These are basically just for demo purposes, but I just kind of give you an idea, get your creative juices flowing. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and open up my notepad, New, and Text Document, and I'm just going to go ahead and give it a title right now. Actually, that's not a title. This is just a file name. I'll cover that here in just a sec. The thing is, though, is that this ends with .txt. Web browsers aren't going to recognize that as a web page. So let's go ahead and open this up. Now, let's go ahead and make this a web page, technically speaking. You can see right here it's .txt. We need to save this as an HTML or HTM file. So go to File, go to Save As. And with Notepad, you want to first come on down here to Save As Type and make that All Files. And then change that .txt to .htm or .html. I'm going to go with the L part. They're both exactly the same. The browsers read them the same way. Just I think HTML has been around a little bit longer than HTM, so I'm going with that. Personal preference. Okay, there we are. Now then if we go back to our folder here, we can see that we've got... Both files are, are blank, but we've got the HTML and the .txt. Frankly, we don't need that anymore, but yeah, we'll keep it here anyway. So let's go ahead and right-click and open this guy. Actually, I've still got them open here, I believe. 
Yep, right there we are. See, there's the .html file right there. So now let's go ahead and add our Fab 5. Now, let me go ahead and come on back to my browser here just for a second. And a very cool reference is w3schools.com. It's a great site. It has lots of details referring to HTML elements. And in this case, we're talking about the declaration. This is what tells the browsers that, hey, this is an HTML5 page, or this is an HTML4 page, or, you know, if you don't have it there, then it's going to read it as something other than an HTML page. So I want this to be an HTML5 page, which, again, is the most recent version of HTML. So if you check out the source code on a lot of the web pages right now, they're going to have this information right here versus this one here. You're just, they still show up okay in your browsers, right? It's just that they do not have the advanced capabilities that the HTML5 pages do. For example, if we come on back here, this is an actual web page. If we right click and go to view page source, and you can see right here where we've got the declaration defining this page as an HTML5 page, just like what we show here. Now, while I'm here, let me go ahead and also mention that we've got the other elements of the Fab Five. That is the HTML tag. And by the way, for every opening tag, we've got a closing tag. The opening HTML tag is here at the very bottom of the page. We've got the closing HTML tag. And the, they're exactly the same, except the closing HTML tag has a forward slash at the very beginning here. Just like with the body tag, which is right here. That's the opening body tag. The closing body tag is, as you may have already noticed, right here. Again, exactly the same, except for this one here has the forward slash at the beginning. Now, I say exactly the same. The opening body tag in this instance has some additional formatting elements, but that's going beyond the basics that I'm covering in this particular video. Now, the head tag, you've got the opening head tag, closing head tag, again with a forward slash there. And we've got the title tag, opening and closing. And for those keeping count, Fab 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, and body makes 5. So that's our example of the code of our basic web page. So let's go ahead and I want to copy this, if I haven't already done so, into my clipboard. Come on back here, paste that at the beginning of our basic web page. And as we saw earlier in the source code of the Google page here, now we need the opening and closing HTML tags. And in this example, by the way, it's not the same as the name of the file. This has to be HTML. HTM, I don't think it's going to work so well in here. So you got to go with the HTML, for those of you keeping track here. And then the closing HTML tag. And I want to bring that down a bit. And in between the opening and closing HTML tag, we want to add our opening and closing head tag. And in between here, we want the title tag. Now, all this head stuff here basically tells the browser a lot of the details about how to present this page. It's the stuff below the closing head tag right in here in the body portion of the web page that is what we're seeing here. That's the goodies. That's the formatting. That's the videos. That's the images. All this stuff above the closing head tag, this is all the coding that tells the browser how to treat things. Still, it's important. Now we need the body tag opening. And we'll bring this down a little bit here. And closing body tag. Now, this is our skeleton of our site. Now, in here is where we put the content. Now, let's go ahead and save this. File, save, and let's open this up in our browser. And come on back to my folder here. And just bring this out a little bit. Let me just drag this guy into the browser. And there it is. Now, this is technically a web page because it's got all the elements of our Fab Five. Let me get this guy away from here and open this up. It's got the declaration and it's got the basic tags required for a web page. What it does not have is the formatting. As you can see here, I do not have any formatting to tell the browser, hey, this is actually on a second line. 
because the browser sees this all on one line. So let's go ahead and throw in some formatting here. This is a header tag which tells the browser, hey, on a scale of one to six or more, I am either really important, that's the H1, or eh, I'm not so important, that's the H6. And it shows this to us in the size of the text sandwiched between these tags. So H1 is going to be huge compared to the H6, for example, which would be much smaller. And let's try another format. Let's try bolding. And let's tell the browser, hey, this is actually the end of this line. Everything after this goes on a different line. And this can be done a couple of ways. You can put this in a paragraph. That's the opening and closing P or a break. For example, let me do the opening and closing P. This would be the closing P. And at the very beginning here, opening P. So let's go ahead and save this. Come on back to our browser here and refresh. And there we are. You can see here where the browser is now seeing that this line here is on a line all its own and that the word this sandwiched between the H1 tags is much more important than the rest of them. That's why it's so, so big. And if we were to make this H6, eh, not so important. You see it's not as important as the rest of this. That's why it's so much smaller. So let me put that back to H1 so you can see what this is. There are just a whole bunch of different tags that can be used here for all kinds of stuff. With the new version, HTML5, there's even more tags that can be used with video or articles. Just all kinds of cool stuff that just wasn't available in the prior versions. So let me go ahead and save this. Refresh. There's that. And to close things out here, I want to demonstrate an example of a tag that does not fall into the opening and closing tag category. This is one that is just a normal tag all on its own. It does not have an opening or a closing. It's just by itself. And it's the break tag. B R space forward slash. And this tells the browser that everything after this break tag goes on a different line. Save, refresh, and there. Now you see where a paragraph adds this extra space here, just like a normal paragraph would. The break tag just puts it on a different line. So that's our basic web page. Now for some additional tags, just to kind of get you playing around, back on our w3schools.com website, if you head on over to w3schools.com forward slash tags forward slash default dot ASP, will give you alphabetically a list of all the current tags. And you'll see there that there are some that are not supported in HTML5, and there are some that just don't work anymore in HTML5 because they were what's called deprecated. That's kind of just tossed in the trash in HTML 4.01. You've got those that say new. So by all means, start playing around with these. Start with your basic web page and go from there. And that's going to bring us to the end of this video on creating a basic HTML page. Thanks for watching and you have a great day. In order to create HTML pages, you will need at least two things, a browser to view your creations in and an editor to create them with in the first place. This video is going to cover the editor part of those two items. Now, when it comes to choosing and using an editor for your HTML pages, you've got a boatload to pick from. As demonstrated here in this Google search results page for HTML editor, there's a little over 1 billion options to choose from. Now of these 1 plus billion options, you have free and you've got paid ones. Now one of the more popular and expensive editors is Dreamweaver, which I believe a few years back was purchased by Adobe, which are the folks that make Photoshop and a few other programs. Now if you already have Dreamweaver or any other HTML editor, then good for you. You're already set. If you do not have an HTML editor, then I suggest do not go out and buy one until you reach that level of web design expertise where you actually need it. And by then, hopefully you'll have plenty of money laying around where you can afford it. Now you can get a bunch done with just the free notepad that comes installed on your computer. 
but it lacks a whole bunch of helpful items that you can get with some of these other free options like Notepad++, Composer, or my new favorite, Komodo. Now, if we check out Notepad++ or Komodo, these are both fantastic in their own right, but they both require you to have some type of coding background, to have some idea as to what the codes mean that will eventually produce a given effect, like larger text or colored background and so on. But with Notepad++, at least ways it gives you what's called a colored syntax, where with your default Notepad program on your computer, it doesn't color code anything. But in both instances, though, you will have to have some idea or some background in coding to know what the eventual display will look like. Likewise with Komodo, you have to have some kind of background in coding for you to be able to know what the eventual display is going to look like, but it's got a whole lot of cool features that something like Notepad++ does not have. Now with Komodo, they do have a paid option. Uh, I think it's a little under 300 bucks. You don't need it. Everything that you're going to need to get started with, you can get with the free version. And with Composer, you can get this at Composer.net. And by the way, Komodo, you can get this at ActiveState.com forward slash Komodo dash edit. And with Notepad++, notepad-plus-plus.org and with Composer it's Composer with a K dot net. Now the big difference here between Composer and these other two is that Composer like Dreamweaver is what's called a WYSIWYG editor that stands for what you see is what you get and this comes in really handy if you know nothing at all about coding because with a WYSIWYG editor you're able to just type into the editor box what you want and with a couple of clicks of some formatting buttons you can have that text or that image do a lot of cool stuff and in the background the program itself in this example composer is creating all the code that the browser will need to be able to decipher and display the way you want it to let me show you what i'm talking about Oh, and by the way, while I'm in my browser up here, let me also point out at Wikipedia, if you do a search for HTML editor from wikipedia.org, you'll end up on this page here, and it gives you a whole lot of information about HTML editors in general and the different types, whether it's a text editor, object editor, WYSIWYG editor, or WYSIWYM editor. And down at the bottom of the page, it gives you a list of a bunch of different editors, be it open source, that's free, or freeware, which is kind of free, and then you go into the commercial software like with the Adobe Dreamweaver or Coffee Cup or if you're a Mac user Coda and Freeway. So be sure and check these out too just to give you a better idea as to what's out there. Well, let me go ahead and open up Notepad++ and as you can see here this is the HTML5 page that I've got in my work folder here and there's really not much to it but it does have the colors of the various elements within the HTML page such as the tags and the attributes and the properties and values are a little bit different in the color so it does help you if you have some background knowledge in coding. Now if we were to open up the same page in Composer, oh and by the way with Composer I've got it set up by default to throw up the tip of the day so you can kind of scroll through here or you can shut it off altogether. But it does give you some additional insight as to what's going on with Composer. But let me go ahead and open up that same document here and we've got a couple of different looks. This is the actual preview, what it will look like for the most part on a browser, or you can go to the source code and it will show you what the code looks like. Or one of the cool things with Composer and with Dreamweaver for that matter is that you can also do a split screen where you can see both the browser preview and the code preview at the same time. So you can make whatever changes you want here in the code area or here in the preview area and that same change will take place here as soon as you make the save. Now one of the other benefits behind a WYSIWYG editor, in this case anyway, is you've got a lot of additional options like adding in CSS or a spell check and some of these items you will also find in Notepad++ as well as Komodo. And let me go ahead and open up Komodo and I'll show you what that looks like. And we'll click on No. And there's just a whole lot of options you can work with here within Komodo as this populates here. We've got some current news. You can purchase the premium version here if you wish. You can check out recent files you've been working on or recent templates you've been working on. Or you can create new file or new projects right from this window or from up here in the menu items. You can choose file, go to new, and choose from a new file. 
or a file from a template that pre-exists within Komodo. Let's go ahead and do that. And you can see here the various languages you can choose from with these templates from XML all the way up to C or C++ or in this example HTML5. I'm going to click on open and it opens up a pre-populated HTML5 document. You can tell because of the HTML5 declaration here. You give it a page title, add whatever content you want and let me just show you this too. As I start typing here with various tags it gives me this little pop-up window here where it can help me complete some of these tasks. For example, if I want to put in a paragraph opening and closing tag, I hit my return key and boom, it all automatically finishes up the opening and automatically adds the closing tag. I put in some text, come up here and save, and give it a name. I'll just leave it at that for the time being. Then I have this feature here that is no longer grayed out where I can actually preview my work inside of the Komodo tab which basically just opens up a window down here or in any installed browsers that I already have. You can also come over here to edit and go into preferences and set your default colors or fonts, adjust your work environment, all kinds of cool stuff. And again, you cannot beat the price for Komodo, Notepad++, or Composer. And that's going to bring us to the end of this video on an introduction to HTML editors. Thanks for watching and have a great day. For most people that have been on the internet for any length of time, saving a file is like blinking. It's done so easily you don't even think about it. You just click click save. Now if you want that file to be a web page that browsers will be able to read, then there are a couple of standards you need to be aware of. Now this video will demonstrate the ways to save your file as a web page. For a basic web page, the file extension needs to be either .htm or .html. They are looked at in the eyes of the browsers as pretty much the same thing, so you can use either one, but for the sake of consistency, pick one and stick with it. Now, I'm going to be using .html mainly because it's been around longer, so if nothing else, out of respect for the elder. Okay, we have the extension part of the naming figured out, but what about the actual file name itself? You can name it really whatever you want, like my first webpage, .html, or any other descriptive type name. But remember to leave zero spaces and no funky characters. Purists say that only lowercase letters should be used, but as far as the browsers are concerned, they don't care if it's a big letter or a little letter. So, letters, numbers, underscores, and hyphens, and anything else should not be used. So now you know that you can name the file pretty much anything you want within the naming guidelines I just mentioned. But here's why you will want to consider just naming it index.html. Let's back up a second here. A web address tells the browser where to look for all the coding of a particular web page so that it will show all the goodies, you know, the images, the text, and formatting. For example, http colon slash slash cxi2.com slash test tells the browsers to head on over to this folder in this domain and show me all the web page goodness. But in that folder named test, there needs to be an HTML file. That HTML file can only be named index.html for the browser to automatically pick it up out of the folder without some additional help. Now let's say for example that file name we wanted to see was not index.html. Then the browser is blind to it, just simply can't see it, and we're going to need to tell the browser the exact name in order for it to be seen. Let me show you what I mean. Now I've already logged into my server through FileZilla, and I'm at the test directory in my domain name. So now then all I need to do is drag my index.html file over to the test directory or you can right click and left click on upload that or just left click hold and drag it on over there either way it's going to end up in the same location and this is the URL now and with this being named index.htm or index.html the browser will automatically pick this up without it actually having to be declared in the URL so let's go ahead and test this let me just copy this come on into the browser paste it up here and go and there's our web page now then if we were to actually declare that file name that being index.html then it will be the exact same thing it's just that it's not necessary the browsers automatically look for index file names in the directories
as you can see, the exact same thing. Refresh, the exact same thing. Now then, let's try this with a different name for the exact same file. Let's come on into our folder here on my desktop. I'm just going to right click, copy, right click, paste, and just rename this anything you want. Name it one of your descriptive names. Myfirstwebpage.html. I'm just going to go ahead and copy that because I'm going to need that here in a second. Copy that into my clipboard. Come on back to our file silo. Refresh this so that file shows up. There we go. Now then let's go ahead and delete this one from our server so it's no longer there. Let's come on back to our browser. Refresh. And there we are. This gives us the contents of that directory. And right now it's empty just as it shows in our FTP client. So now let's go ahead and upload our same exact file only with a different name, the descriptive name. Left click, hold and drag it on over. Now then if we come on back to our directory here and refresh, unlike with the index.html file, the browser doesn't recognize it automatically. It sees it's there in the directory, but it's not pulling it up unless we specifically declare it in the URL like this. And there it is, the exact same web page. But if you do not save that HTML file as index.htm or HTML, then the browser will not automatically pick it up. You'll have to specify that name in the URL. So to recap, you need to use the extension .html or .htm. And if you want the browser to auto find the home page, then it needs to be named index.html or index.htm. Otherwise, you need to provide the exact file name within the web address. That's going to bring us to the end of this video on saving your HTML files. This video will introduce you to what's called nesting HTML tags, as well as some basic coding in your HTML web page construction. Now, there are at least five things that every web page needs in order for it to be an actual HTML web page. You have to have the declaration, the HTML, head, title, and body tags. You also need to have the web page file saved as an HTML file or HTM file. And it is customary to name most web pages as index, but you can name it whatever you want. Browsers will automatically look for the index.html file first, so unless you have a good enough reason not to, you should just go ahead and name it index.html. Now, nesting is when you assign different HTML elements to the same block of content and an HTML element is an opening and closing tag. Well, let me show you what I'm talking about. Let me open up my little HTML document here. In this example, we've got an opening head tag and we've got a closing head tag. These represent an HTML element, the opening and closing tags of a particular tag. Likewise, an opening title tag and a closing title tag. These two items, opening and closing, represent an HTML element. So whenever you combine two different elements, and in this example, those elements are head tags and title tags, to a particular block of content, in this case, the title, then we're talking about nesting. So technically speaking, this is an example of nesting, but not the example I want to go into here. The example I want to go into is these two guys right here, these two sentences right here. I want to make this one a paragraph, so that kind of stands out away from this one here. And to make it stand out even further, I want to make this bold and italicized. And this one, not. So this example of nesting will be three different elements on this one block of content. It's going to be a paragraph, it's going to be bolded, and it's going to be italicized. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Now, first off, let me go ahead and pull this guy into our browser to see what it looks like right now without any of the formatting. And by the way, these are the five elements I was talking about earlier that most every HTML document has to have before it's technically an HTML document. That's the declaration. In this case, this doc type represents that it's an HTML5 web page. Then we've got the HTML tag, that's number two, the head tag, number three, title tag, number four, and the body tag, number five. And we've got the representing closing tags of each. Closing head tag, closing title tag, closing body tag, and closing HTML tag. Now, most every opening tag will be accompanied by a closing tag. Not all the time, though, but most of the time it will be. So on with our example here. Let's go ahead and pull this guy in. I'm in my Chrome browser, so just hitting the Control key on my keyboard and the letter O for open, it will allow me to navigate to the location of my index file. And here we are with no formatting whatsoever. 
As you can see here, we've got this on two different lines, but the browser doesn't see that because it's not formatted properly to show that we want it to be on two different lines, bolded, italicized, and so on. So let's go ahead and do that now. So we want to make this a paragraph. So we've got the opening P tag for paragraph and the closing paragraph tag, which is exactly the same way as the opening tag, only it starts with a forward slash, then the rest of that tag, in this case, the P. And we save this, come on back here and refresh, and there's our representation of the paragraph tag. Come on back here. The thing about nesting is that the opening tags really are not in any particular order, but for it to be properly coded, the closing tags have to be in the exact opposite order of the opening tags. So again, opening tags, no order is required, but however you place those opening tags determines how the closing tags must be placed for it to be properly coded. Now, if it's improperly coded, a lot of browsers nowadays will still show it properly formatted, but if it's incorrectly coded, some browsers will not. Some browsers like, for example, on your smartphones or your tablets, they might get confused and just not show it properly the way that you want it to be shown anyway. And that's where properly coding your nesting tags will come in handy. So here we've got B for bold and they have to be in exact opposite order. So it's P, B. So to properly nest this it must be B, P. Forward slash and B. Save this. Come on back here, refresh. And there you go. Now we want to add some italics. So we put in the I for the italicized opening tag. And remember, we need to put the closing tag in the opposite order. So we want to make sure that it's PBI, IBP. So we put our closing italicized tag right there. Save. Come back and refresh. And there we go. Now then, that's pretty simple so far. In this example, if we wanted to just have portions of our content to be italicized or portions of it to be bolded, then just remember you have to have the closing tags in the opposite order of the opening tags. So if I just wanted this here to be bolded, but I wanted this here to be italicized, let me get rid of these guys here. Then I'd have my opening italicized tag here. And then I wanted all of this to be italicized. So I put my closing italicized tag here. But this kind of screws up the opposite order of the closing tags with the opening tags. So what I need to do is to close out the italicized tag here. Again, to maintain the order. Then reopen them here. And of course, I've got the closing tag here. So now then, we've got everything in the proper order. Hopefully that makes sense. We just try to remember whether we are using just the simple example as I demonstrated earlier, or a little bit more complex like this one, you always have to have the closing tags in the opposite order of the opening tags. So in closing, nesting is okay if you do it the right way. That's going to bring us to the end of this video on nesting HTML elements. Thanks for watching. You have a great day. One item you will eventually need in your web design is colors. And when I talk about colors, I'm also talking about black and white. Browsers interpret colors one of three ways. The color name, you know, like blue, black, green, magenta. The colors RGB code and the R is red, G is green, B is blue. And by using a code called hexadecimal. This video will mostly deal with the hexadecimal method. Now, when we add hex colors to our HTML presentations, we do so with the pound sign and a sequence of three pairs of digits following the pound sign, hash symbol, number sign, whatever. These six digits will range from zero to nine and A to F. So there will never be a color code with a Z in it, for example, only zero through nine and A through F. Since there are a little more than 16 million different color possibilities, memorizing all of them might be a bit much for Joe Average, so I'm going to show you a web page that shows you the different hexadecimal colors, so all you have to do is simply pick the color you want, and the hex code is shown right there for you. Simple Simon. Okay, let's check out this cheat sheet that I was talking about. Then we will add some colors to an HTML document for some real-world applications. Now basically, we can just do a search for HTML colors and then just choose images. Let me show you what I'm talking about. 
go to our favorite search engine and in my example here it's Google as you can see here about a billion and a half results but at this point if we just go to images we've got a whole bunch of options here to work with so just pick one that you like and stick with it let's go ahead and choose this first one here for example and we just click on the image there and it brings up a list of all these colors with the hexadecimal code and as you can see here there's six digits on each one and don't forget that whenever you put one of these color codes or hexadecimal codes into your HTML document they must all begin with that hashtag or number sign or pound sign now what I normally do is if I'm trying to match a color to an existing layout that I have maybe a header image or some button that I'm wanting to match with then I will use a color picture and there's several to choose from. I'm using the Chrome browser and if we come over to the Chrome Web Store and that's at chrome.google.com forward slash web store then you can just do a search for Colorzilla and like any other add-on or extension be it for Firefox or for Chrome then you just simply install that particular extension and you're good to go. Let me show you. I've already got this one installed but at this point you would just click on this click on the added to Chrome and this is already added to mine so I'm going to go over to my extensions here go to tools go to extensions and I've got a lot of mine turned off just to increase the speed of my browser but right here is Colorzilla and I just want to enable it and you see it just puts it up right here so now then if I want to check out a an exact color to one of my say buttons that I'm wanting to match or a header image and I just click on the Colorzilla color picker and come on down here and you can see right up here is the color the hexadecimal code the RGB code and as you can see here the 006699 in this box here matches that in the hex code in the hex code up top here 003399 and so on so that's how I can get an exact match of an existing image that I already have and another option is you can use this online color picker at colorpicker.com and right here it's giving you the hex code that you can choose from any number of just kind of moving this guy around here and you can also choose from the RGB code here and whenever you get a color that you like you just click on add to my colors and it will add it down here like so so then you can just come on back here and click on this and it shows you that hex code there and here it shows you that hex code there and so on so this might be a nice site for you to bookmark along with a page like this that has a whole list of them now another option that I would go for is using something like the color pickers in Photoshop or GIMP for example but of course that requires you to install those particular software and with Photoshop it also requires you to buy it which can be kind of a hefty sum so that's a quick rundown on the colors let's go ahead and demonstrate this in an actual HTML page let me go ahead and open up my Komodo and I've already done that here let's go to file new and let's go to template HTML5 and here we go now then now I've added some content here into our HTML document and I went ahead and added some styling up here in the head tag and some content down here in the body section now the quick rundown here for the body I've made the background yellow and I've used the colored name for this and for the h1 tag I made the color for the text red that's FF at the very beginning remember RGB and for the h2 tag I made the color blue remember RGB red green blue and for the paragraph color I made it blue and here I use the color name now these are just using the F's and the zeros you can go all out and use any number of these color codes here for example to really add some pizzazz or matching the surrounding color scheme of your site well, let's go ahead and save this and take a look at this in our browser yeah that'll be fine for now and preview this in our Komodo tab just to kind of keep things close by here here we go now then if we were to change this to a hexadecimal code remember we have to start it off with the pound sign or hashtag and we can only go from 0 to 9 A to F or any combination thereof I have no idea what that color combo is going to be but let's just see save that okay kind of a nasty blue and if we were to go all F's like so but if we want to change this to this color of green for example for the H1 tag 006600 don't forget we have to have the hashtag at the very beginning save and there we go so there you are that's how you can add some additional coloring to your web design and a few spots on the internet for you to go to get some additional color ideas and some browser add-ons 
whether you are using Chrome, Firefox, and I'm not sure if there's one for Safari, Internet Explorer, or Opera, but they may have something. And if not, you always have those items like the online color pickers too. That's going to bring us to the end of this video on HTML and CSS colors. Thanks for watching. You have a great day. When you have a website that has many different pages, you're going to want to have some type of navigation area or menu area that your visitors can go to in order to click on the links for page 2 or page 3 or the home page or your about page and so on. This video will show you how to add these navigation links to your site. Now I'm going to be using the Komodo HTML editor in this demo, but you can do the same thing in pretty much any editor. So I've got my editor open here and I've got my home page or index.html page here page two and page three. Let me show you what they look like in the folder. Now this is on my desktop, but this is the same setup that should be in place if you have these on the server or on the internet. They should all be in the same directory as your image folder and so on. So let's get on back to the editor here. And I've got a little bit of styling up here in the head section. I've got the navigation links right here in text form. They're not in clickable link form yet. And some content down here, some funky styling based on what's up here. Now, on the home page where we're at right now, I do not make this clickable. On page two, this file here, I would not make page two clickable, just the home page and page three. On the page three file, you guessed it, I would not make the page three text clickable, only page two and the home page. That's just the way I do things. Others might not do it the same way totally up to you. Now how we do this is we add an anchor tag. So I'm going to go ahead and put my opening anchor tag here. That's the opening bracket, the letter A, just like we have showing right here in this pop-up box, and space. We now need the attribute href. I used to call this the ahref tag and I was always wrong in doing so. It's the A tag or anchor tag with the href attribute. And that's h R E F equal sign and then we want to put a couple of double quotes in there and then close that out. Now Komodo, this editor that I'm using, automatically, the way I've got things set up here anyway, automatically puts in the closing anchor tag there. I'm just going to cut that out of there and put that at the end of page two right there. Now in between the two double quotes is where we put the name of the file we're referencing with this text. So I need the name of the page two file which is right here. That's all lowercase p-a-g-e dash two dot html. It has to be exactly as it is. So come on back to my editor here. Cursor right in there. p-a-g-e dash two dot html. And we're golden there. I'm just double checking href page Quote, close. Okay. Same thing for page three. Opening anchor tag. Space. And with the Komodo editor, I can just scroll on down here until I get to the href. Make sure that's highlighted. Hit my enter key. Bing, bang, boom. Put in a couple of double quotes. Close that out. Get this guy out of the way here. Cut. Put it at the end there. Paste. And in between the double quotes, put the name of the file, page 3html And we are solid gold. Just a quick double check there. Yep. And now I want to make this a little more stylish. I'm going to put this as an H2 tag. Opening bracket, H2. Closing bracket. And just cut this guy on out of there. And paste it at the very end here. Let's go ahead and save this. And let's check this guy out in our Chrome browser. And click on preview. And there we go. Home page, page two, page three. There's our page two, yet to be styled up here. And let's go ahead and do that real quick. Come on back here and onto page two. And this time I need to add the clickable links to the home page and page three. And there we are. I just paused the video there while I did all the typing. And I've got the opening H2 tag, just as we did with the page one, as referenced here on the Chrome browser, and the closing H2 tag. And then I've got the opening anchor tag with the href attribute, the name of the home page file, that's index.html. And then there's the closing anchor tag for the home page. Did not do anything for page two and then the opening anchor tag and the href attribute for page three, and then the closing 
anchor tag for page three and I've already saved that and same thing with page three I've already added all the needed tags here to make these navigation links clickable opening h2 tag closing h2 tag opening anchor tag for the home page and closing anchor tag for the home page opening anchor tag for page two closing anchor tag for page two and nothing for page three so let's come on back here and refresh and we are on the home page now so you can see here Go to page two. This is page two. Should be clickable link to the home page, clickable link to the page three. On page three, we have a clickable link to page two. Boom. And come back to page three and a clickable link to the home page and so on. And that's how you can add a clickable link navigation area to the pages on your website. Thank you very much for watching and you have a great day. When you click on a link in a web page, you are then taken to the destination defined in the hyperlink URL. This video will show you the different targets you can define in the HTML link syntax that allow you more control in how the link acts when the visitor clicks on it. Here, getting back to my first point, if you have an affiliate link, for example, on your web page and somebody clicks on that link, whoosh, they're taken off your site and onto the site of the product you are promoting. This may not be the perfect scenario because whether the visitor buys from clicking on your affiliate link or not, they are no longer on your website and may never get back there again. Bye bye but there is a way you can craft the code on the affiliate link so that when the visitor clicks on it an entirely new window or tab opens and takes the visitor to the affiliates product this leaves your website still active and open on the visitors browser this way whether or not the visitor buys from your affiliate link they still have your website open so they're more likely to come back and check out more of your site Cha ching so in this video, I want to show you how you can craft these target attributes. That's what they're called. And I've got the basic coding set up for our HTML5 page and a little bit of the content down here in the body section. Now what I want to do here is I've got in this header section here, I've got three areas. I've got my site. I've got big affiliate site number one. I need to put a link there that's going to open up in a different window or tab. And I've got big affiliate site number two, which also I want to open up in a separate window or tab. So we're actually going to be demonstrating two different methods that you can have the link open in a different window. So let me go ahead and craft the link for the big affiliate site number one. Come on over here at the beginning. I need to put the opening anchor tag. That's the opening bracket A space href equals double quotes and then close my double quotes because that's the address I'm going to be sending them to is the big affiliate site number one but now I need to put in the attribute to define the target and in this one it's going to be underscore blank so I use the attribute target equals double quote underscore and then blank close off my double quotes and close off the syntax with the closing bracket. And this is the code that we use to open up a new window. And of course, I've also got the closing tag, which I need to relocate by cutting that and putting it at the end of what I want to be clicked on. And that's just automatically put in there with the particular settings that I have on the Komodo editor here. So now let me show you the other way that we're going to use this. Then I'll demonstrate the difference between the two. Let me go ahead and move this on over here. So I'm gonna add basically the same thing copy and paste these ways up to here anyway for big affiliate site number two now then this particular attribute is a little bit different we're still going to be using the target equals attribute but instead of underscore blank I'm going to use new space close off that and get my closing anchor tag out of the way there put it at the end here now both of these different setups will kind of sort of do the same thing in that they will both open a new window or a tab. That's where the similarities end. With the underscore blank, this one will open up a new window each and every time. And using the target equals new will only open one new window. And every link clicked with the target value of new will replace the page loaded in the previously open window that was opened by somebody clicking on the link with the target value of new. I'm sure that made a whole bunch of sense, but let me just demonstrate just in case it didn't. So let me go ahead and save this. I'm going to open it up in our Chrome browser. So let's come on over here to preview in our Chrome browser. Pull this guy over here. And it didn't open in the right one. Let me open it up in this one. There we are. 
So now that the big affiliate site number one is the target underscore blank. That's the one that's going to open up a new window each and every single time. This one here, target equals new, and that's what's only going to open a new window one time. And that one window is what's going to be used for each and every link that uses the target reference new. Let me demonstrate this one. New, new tab. Come back here. Another new tab. And I think you get the idea. It will always open a new tab. Let me close these out. And with this one here, with the target equals new, opens a new tab, but it always goes to that one. It's not going to open up any more new tabs. It's only going to open up one. So if there were a whole bunch of different links on here and each one of those had the target new attribute, they would all be using this one tab. Just that the other links would be replacing the prior link that was open originally in this particular tab. Now, on a side note, the target attribute was deprecated in HTML4, but HTML5 has reversed that. So if you're using the HTML5 declaration like we are, come on back here, right here, then the target attribute will validate. Now, if you're using an HTML4 declaration, meaning you're creating an HTML4 web page, then it might not validate. More than likely, it won't. And by the way, validation basically looks for HTML errors and non-standard coding. Most browsers today are pretty forgiving, but some might display your non-standard coded web page all kind of funky. So that's why it's a good idea to follow proper coding standards. And in the HTML5 environment, the target attribute is good to go. And that's going to bring us to the end of this video on the link targets for your HTML page. Thanks for watching. You have a great day. This video is going to show you how you can add images to your web pages. Now I've already added the images to my images folder here. And now what I want to do is write the code in the index file to bring those images onto that index page. Let me open up my images folder here and I'll show you those images. Right here we go. And this one here as I hover over you can see it's 400 by 350 and the easy button image is 300 by 298 couple of pretty good sized images. Now this is my editor here and this is the Komodo editor and what we need now is somewhere between the opening and closing body tag we need to use the image tag and this is a single tag in other words there's not going to be an opening image tag and a closing image tag it's all kind of wrapped into the same thing. Let's go ahead and put in our opening bracket IMG space and then the closing part of our image tag and that's it. Now this alone is not going to do anything for us as far as adding our images but this is the actual image tag. In other words there's no closing image tag it's all wrapped into one. Now then what I want to do is go ahead and put in a space and use the src attribute just like it's showing here in the pop-up and then equals a couple of double quotes and in between these double quotes, I'm going to put the location of those images. And this easy button, for example, is right here in the images folder. So that's the first thing. Then we need to put a forward slash in the name of the file and then the file type. I'm just going to go ahead and put this guy in my clipboard. Come on back here. And again, it's in the images folder. Forward slash and name of the image. Dot JPG. And that's it that should produce our image. So let me go ahead and save this and let's preview this. And let's try our Chrome browser. And there's our easy button image. Now that's how you can put the image into your web page. Now there's actually a few other things we can do with this. You can actually style it a little bit more with some additional attributes. You can put a border around it. You can even make this smaller. For example, right now, let me see how big is this. This is 300 by 298. Let's knock that down a little bit. Say 150 by 150. That'd be pretty close. And you do that by adding the height and width attributes. So we're going to space H E I G H T equals a couple of double quotes. And then between this double quote, I'm going to go 150 space width double quote 150 close those double quotes and you can go on like I said add border and so on but I'm not going to do that now then let's go ahead and uh, save this come on back here and refresh 
and they're now a much smaller one. Now the drawback to this, even though it works just fine, the drawback to this is that the browser actually loads the original video size and then it scales it down based on those additional attributes. So in order to increase the speed of your page loading, instead of having the visitor's browser do all that resizing, I would go ahead and make the image the size you want it to be displayed, rather than having it a large image and then putting in those additional attributes and having the browser do all that heavy lifting. And that's how you can add images to your web pages and even add some additional attributes. In this example, resizing that original image. That's gonna bring us to the end of this video. Thanks for watching and you have a great day. This video will demonstrate how to use HTML comments. The HTML comments is used and created the same way whether you are using an HTML 4.0 document or an XHTML document or an HTML5 document. Now I'm going to be demonstrating an HTML5 document, but again, it's done the same way as the others. The biggest reason I use comments is as a reminder or a note for me within the HTML code. The comments are not processed by the browser, so no one else sees the comments unless they look at the source code, which is done in the browser by usually just right-clicking on the web page and choosing View Page Source. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Let's head on over to, oh, let's try Chow Chow's. Cool dogs. American Kennel Club. Now let's check out their page, and depending upon the browser you're using would depend on actually how you do this. Most of the time, you just right-click, and you got something that says View Page Source or Page Source or something like that. I think Internet Explorer might be a little bit different. But this is the code that makes that page look the way that it does. And an example of the opening and closing comments tag is just this right here. Everything in here is not being seen by the browser. Of course, everything above the closing head tag is not being seen by the browser either. But just as a demonstration, just bear with me here. The comment tags can be either in the head tag or in the body tag. Either case, they're not going to be seen in the browser window. But this is a demonstration of what a comment looks like. This is the opening comment tag, and this is the closing comment tag. Now, as an example of a reminder or a note that I would use in my HTML markup would be to let me know that in between the opening and closing comment tag, put this particular code, like an autoresponder, or this is where my sales page begins, or something like that. Let me see, like for example, right here. This is commented out, but it's used as a note, I would imagine, to the people that made this page, that hey, this is the beginning of where the Quancast script goes, and this is the ending of the Quancast script. I would do the same thing for autoresponders. But that's an example of using a comment tag for a note or a reminder. Let's come on back to Googly here. Now, another way that I would use a comment tag is whenever I'm customizing a web page and I want to see what the page would look like if this certain element was not there, like a search box or an image. Instead of simply deleting that element, I would go ahead and comment it out first, and if I like the look without that element, then I would go ahead and delete it. And if I didn't like the look, then I wouldn't have to worry about typing it back in. I just simply remove the opening and closing comment tags. Poof, it's right back to the way it was. Now, one more way that the comment tag should be used more often, especially from developers, is you can add your own branding info, like name, email, and web address, and have it commented out so it would not appear in the browser window, but when the source code is viewed by someone that wanted to see the code, your information would be staring them right in the face, and they now know who made this site, and who knows, you might drum up some extra business that way. Let's go ahead and open up our HTML editor, and in this demo, I'm using the Komodo editor, and let's throw in a comment here just to demonstrate what it looks like. Now, we saw there on the American Kennel Club website what the comment tags look like. Let's go ahead and throw something in the body section here, and now that, let's go ahead and save this, and that's what it looks like. Now, if we were to go ahead and comment that out, that's the opening bracket, the exclamation mark, which is holding the shift key down, hitting your number one, and then a couple of dashes. And you see, after you do that, with the opening tag presented first, it comments out everything else after that on the entire page. So you might want to be a little careful there. Myself, I always put the closing comment tag in first. That way, nothing is changed until I put in the opening comment tag. Hopefully, that made sense. And there you saw how the rest of this came back to life. And this right now is commented out. You can see how it's kind of lighter in color and it's italicized. Let's go ahead and save this and I'll show you how this looks down here. And even though I did not delete this, it went ahead and the browser moved the paragraph tag right up to the very beginning 
as if this was not even in existence at all. And that's a few examples of how you can use the comment tag. And that's going to bring us to the end of this video on comments. Thanks for watching. You have a great day. This video is going to be about the metadata and the meta tags located in the head section in your HTML web page. Now, meta tags are not used as heavily as they used to be back whenever the search engines relied a lot on the stuff in the metadata. Now, there are, however, a few that I would suggest to include in your web page because they are used by the search engines in how your site info is displayed in the search results and by some browsers in how they load or reload your web pages. Now, the meta tags go in between the opening and the closing head tag like the title tags do. Now, here are a few meta tags that I think you should include in your web page markup. Description, keywords, author, and char set. And while I do not and while I do not use this one, some people I spoke to say that if there are elements on the web page like ads for example that change when the page is refreshed, then adding the meta tag that auto refreshes the page might come in handy. And I'll cover that here in just a second as well. So I've got my Komodo HTML editor open and I want to go up here and just below the title tag. And it doesn't matter if it's below or above. I'm going to go ahead and enter in the char set tag. And this is a little bit different in HTML5 versus HTML 4.01. And this being an HTML5 page as shown by the declaration here, we need to use this form for the char set. That's the opening bracket, meta, space, and then the char set equals attribute with UTF minus 8 as the value. And again, if you're looking at the code of an HTML4 page, then it would look a little bit different. Actually, there's a lot more to it. So I'm going to go ahead and hit the return key. And this next one is the meta description tag. And you've got the opening bracket, meta, space, and the name equals attribute with the description as the value. And you've got the content equals attribute with the actual description of that web page being the value here. And it's this information that's going to show up in the search engine results next to your listing. And you've got a limit somewhere around 150 maybe even 160 characters not words but characters so you can have a larger description but only that amount will show up in the description area this is the description area that I'm talking about so if this description here went on to like 250 characters well, well you'd only have about 150 or 160 characters showing up here and maybe a dot 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 at the end so it's a good idea to get as much of your information out in those first 150 to 160 characters that will best describe your web page. Now, I'm no expert on search engine optimization, but I would go ahead and consider using some pretty powerful keywords in this description area that are also located on your web page. Speaking of which, that brings me to my next meta tag, and that's the keywords. Oh, and by the way, don't forget to close this out. This is one of those single tags that do not require an additional closing tag. In other words, this is not an actual closing tag for the meta tags. It's all contained within the same tag here, a single tag. But you just add a space, forward slash, and then the closing bracket. Let's go ahead and add in that next meta tag. And again, this one is our keywords meta tag. And just like before, we've got the opening bracket, meta space, then the name equals attribute, keywords being the value, space, and then like the description, we've got the content equals attribute, and then inside the double quotes here, we've got different keywords. Now, of course, this here is just a description of this tag, but the keywords are separated by comma and a space. And like the description, there is a limit here. So I would make this very limited. As a matter of fact, I'd probably keep this to three to five keywords tops. Now, since this is on meta tags and not search engine optimization, I'm not going to go into a great deal of description on what keywords are or what the description should be. But just know, though, that you should not go overboard with the amount of keywords you have listed here. Now, another one that I don't use that much, but I have seen that it is a good idea to include and that's the author meta tag. And the last one here I do not use because I frankly don't find the need for it. But as I said, some folks say that it works pretty good. And that's the refresh tag. And that's the opening bracket meta space HTTP dash equiv equals. And then you've got the double quotes with the word refresh in the middle. And then you got the space and then the content equals attribute 30. This is the number of seconds, and this is the number of seconds that the page will remain before it automatically refreshes. So if you want your page to refresh every 15 seconds or every 45 seconds, 
then adjust this accordingly. Then just go ahead and make this five seconds just for the sake of testing it. Let me go ahead and save this and let's open this in, oh, let's say the Chrome browser and see if this refreshes here. Yep, if you blinked, you missed it every five seconds. Okay, so that does work. And that's going to bring to an end this video on meta tags. Thanks for watching. And you have a great day. Prior to HTML5, when you added an audio or video file to your web page, you did so through a particular plugin like QuickTime or Flash or Flash Movie, but maybe not everyone that visits your web page has that particular plugin installed or updated on their browser. They would then be prompted to install or update the plugin on their browser. Now, not everyone would do this, and many would simply just move on to another website. HTML5 solves that issue with the use of the audio and video tag. This video will show you how to add an audio file to your HTML5 web page. Now, the current problem with adding audio to your HTML5 web page is that some browsers are not recognizing all audio formats. The way things are at this time is that if you want the majority of your site visitors to hear your audio files, then you have to add more than one audio format so that the different browsers recognize and play your audio file. Now setting this up is not difficult at all as you'll soon see here in a second. The problem as I see it is that instead of having one mp3 audio file at say 2 megs, now I have to have additional audio formats at roughly the same size or even larger if I'm going to be using uncompressed files like the WAV file. Now, if I use a lot of audio files because, well, maybe I do regular podcasts and those podcasts are 30 minutes or an hour or longer, then this will put a sizable increase in my online hosting cost. Now, in this demonstration, I have several different formats of the same audio file that I'm going to be using in making this HTML5 web page demo. Let's have a look. Now, I've got the three different files here. They're all the same name, but different formats. Here's the ever popular MP3. And the size here is 296 kilobytes. Now these other two formats, the uncompressed wave and the AIF, that's the audio interchange file format. Well, you can see they're a heck of a lot larger than the 296 kilobytes of the MP3. Now let's go ahead and open up my Komodo HTML editor. And here is how the audio tag is set up. And it's basically the audio tag. That's the opening bracket, the word audio, space, and then the attribute that brings in the controls onto the web page, you know, the pause and the play and the fast forward controls. And that's simply the attribute controls equal open double quotes, controls, close double quotes, and then the closing bracket. That's all there is to it. And here we have the, the different source files. And I've got the MP3 set up first, then the WAV file set up second, and the AIF set up third. Now, you may not need all three of these. Let me show you a few sites that might come in handy for you. Now the html5test.com site will keep you up to date on the different formats that the different browsers support. I mean all of them. For example, this is the Chrome browser and if you were to bookmark this and use this on your different browsers, and by the way, if you're a web developer, you should have more than one browser installed on your computer. Frankly, I would suggest at least four, the four big guys, Chrome, Firefox, Internet Explorer, and Safari. You may also want to include Opera in there, but that's totally up to you. Now, just to give you an example, on Chrome, out of 500 total points, Chrome's getting 468. Not too shabby. You do the same test on Internet Explorer 9, you're going to get you 138 points, I think it is. But that's beside the point. You can check all that stuff out on your own. But right here tells you the audio portion of this browser and the different formats that it does support. And in this case, the one that it does not support. So Chrome's pretty cool. Right now, it says A-OK -okay on the MP3. You do the same thing on your Internet Explorer, on your Safari, and on your Firefox. And you're not going to find the same on all of those browsers. As a matter of fact, I think all of those will support MP3 except for Firefox. So since Firefox is a pretty popular browser, you're going to want to provide your site visitors with some type of a format that that browser supports. So using this site to check those will work out great. A couple more sites for you to check into and possibly bookmark if you don't already have some type of software that converts one format to another is online-convert and Zamzar. Both of these convert a lot of different formats to a lot of different other formats. In this case, we're just talking audio formats. They both do pretty much the same thing. They're both free, 
and they both allow you to download the converted file. Zamzar is a little different in that they require you to insert your email address here. They will then email you the download link as soon as the conversion takes place. Online-convert.com? No. They do it all right here on the site and they provide you with a download link and online-convert also allows you some additional customizations. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Let's say we want to convert our WAV file or MP3 file into an AIFF or an AAC file. Right here is where you upload the file that you want to convert or you can put in the URL of that file but you are also able to make some additional changes here depending upon the file type that you upload. Then click on convert file and depending upon how large that file is that you uploaded would depend on how long it takes for that conversion process to take place. Then boom you got your download link right there. Download it, you're good to go. So out of these three sites, Zamzar, online-convert.com and html5test.com of these, you should have at least two of these bookmarked on your site somewhere for future reference. Okay, let's get on back to the coding. So we've got the opening tag, and inside of the opening audio tag, we have the space, then we've got the controls, attribute, equals, open double quotes, controls, close double quote, then the closing bracket for the opening audio tag. Then we've got the source here and the different file formats. Again, each of these are the same name. Looks like we got a little mistake here, so the AIF would not be playing because you don't have the colon there, you have the double quotes. But here's what you do. You have a source tag, space, then you have the source attribute, which is SRC equals, and again, you got the double quotes opening and the double quotes closing here at the end. In between there, you've got the name of the file and then the name of the format. Then you've got the space after the double quote. Then you've got the type attribute, which is type equal open double quote. Then you've got the word audio slash then the name of that format of that file. In this case, it's MP3. Close double quote and then the closing bracket. Likewise, for any additional sources that you have, so now let's make sure we save this. Let's preview this. Try it in Chrome. And with Komodo, this guy pops up here. Click on Preview, and there it is. In video 12, you're going to learn the step. There's the Chrome. And you'll notice also that we've got different looking players depending upon the browser that we're in. Let's preview this in Firefox. See, different looking player. In video 12, you're going to learn the steps involved in setting up an eBay store. And let's try this in Safari. And you'll have an even different look. And, video steps involved. and that's it. That's how you can add the audio tag to your HTML5 page and a couple of additional pages you might want to bookmark for future reference. That's going to bring us to the end of this video on adding audio to your HTML5 page. Thanks for watching. You have a great day. Prior to HTML5, when you added a video to your web page, you did so through a particular plugin like QuickTime or Flash, but maybe not everyone that visits your web page has that particular plugin installed or updated on their browser. They would then be prompted to install or update their plugin. Not everyone would do that, and many would just simply move on to another website. HTML5 solves that issue with the use of the video tag. But after you see this video, you may decide to stick with the old way, at least for now. The current problem with adding video to your HTML5 web page is that all browsers are not recognizing all video formats. The way things are at this time is if you want a majority of the major browsers to play your video, then you have to add all the various video formats that the different browsers recognize. Setting this up is not difficult at all, as you'll see here in a second. The problem, as I see it, is that instead of having one MP4 video file at, say, 25 or 50 megabytes, or however big it is, now I have to have multiple video formats at roughly the same size. That will put a sizable increase in my online video hosting costs. Now, I have several formats of the same video that I'm going to use in making this HTML5 web page demo. Let's go ahead and have a look at that folder real quick. Now, this is the HTML page right here, and here are four video formats that are the same exact video, and it's only about, what, 20 seconds in length there. Now, you can see the MP4 is about 214k and the WebM format of the same video is 407k, almost twice the size. 
Now remember this is an 18 second video and if you have multiple formats like the MP4, maybe the OGG and the WebM, maybe even the MOV as well for the H.264 formats, then you are going to be hosting a lot of videos. So that is something you want to keep in mind. Now here's a couple of websites I want to point out to you as far as seeing which browsers work with which formats, HTML5Test.com. Now, as a web developer, you should already have several of the major browsers installed on your computer anyway, at least Chrome, Firefox, and Internet Explorer. I'd also include Safari and Opera, but that's totally up to you. And with those installs, you can test any web page. You can test all of your web-related items to see how they would look on those particular browsers. And if on some of your web pages you have some type of software, like Google Analytics, for example, that tells you the browser use of the visitors popping over to your website, then that might also give you an idea as to which browsers you should be focusing on for your videos to be played on. Anyway, test this out on your browsers. And if you come on down here, right up close to the top, we've got the video format here. And this tells us what formats that the Chrome browser currently supports. And I say currently because they're constantly updating their browsers. Likewise with Firefox, likewise with Internet Explorer and so on. So if you were to bookmark this site in your browser, come on back to it every now and then, especially right after you have an update that takes place. See if any of these have changed from the red X to a green check mark. Now, just seeing this here, the Chrome browser supports all of these guys here. A couple other sites, Zamzar and OnlineConvert.com are two great sites because they're not requiring you to download software in order to convert your file formats from say the mp4 that you have to an ogg that you don't have and might need how these work pretty simple you choose the file from your computer you decide on which format you want to convert it to enter your email address click on convert it'll send you an email whenever the conversion has taken place and in that email is the download link for your converted file now online-convert.com pretty similar only they don't send you an email they convert it and then supply you with a download link right here on the site so for example you go over here to the video converter you can see they've got all kinds of converters here just like Zamzar does choose what you want to convert it to let's say you want to convert it to OGG this then pops up come on down here choose the file from your computer or enter the URL of the file you want to convert. Make any changes here that you want. Click on Convert File. It'll go through the process, and depending upon how large the file is that you are converting, will depend on how quickly they get the job done. And then, boom, the page changes, and you've got the download link right there. Now let's take a look at that code. I'm using the Komodo editor here, but you can do the same thing with in most any editor. Inside the body tag here is our content. And inside that content, we've got our video. We've got the opening video tag, and inside of that opening video tag, we've got a, a couple of attributes. The main one is the controls attribute, and that tells the browser to add the play, pause, fast forward controls, whatever controls there are on that particular player that that browser has. This is what brings in those controls. And I went ahead and added an additional attribute, autoplay, to make it autoplay whenever the browser opens up. And then I added these to further design the way that video appears. You don't have to have these. These are not default. By default, you just have the opening video tag. But you also have to add the controls attribute in order for the controls to show up. But these here, you don't have to have. But the video that I've got right here is by default 640 by 480. So I added the width and height attributes along with these values to bring it down in size. And then as far as adding the actual video, you've got the source tag and then the source equals attribute with the values equaling the file name and the format name. So the file name in this example is movie and the format here is the WebM. Now after you have in the file name, you have the close double quotes, space, then you have to put in the type attribute and that's type equals open double quotes and then inside of there, you have to have the word video, forward slash, and then the type of format. Just like here we have WebM, here it needs to be WebM. Here we have MP4, this needs to be video slash MP4. And here we have OGG, this one needs to be the type equals video slash OGG. Now having these three in there, 
we're covering pretty much all the bases. We could probably get by with just these top two. And in addition to that, I also have this down here in case whatever browser they're using does not support any of these. They're not just going to get a blank page. They'll get a notice saying your browser does not support the HTML5 video tag. So let's go ahead and preview this in our browser. Let's try Chrome. There we are. And... And let's try Safari. As you can see here, the player is a little different depending upon the browser it's playing in. And that's pretty much it. You now have the tools needed to add videos using the HTML5 video tag in your HTML5 web pages. Thanks for watching. You have a great day. This video will show you how to set up an ordered list in your HTML document. First off, what the heck's an ordered list? An ordered list is a list of items with a definite order, like Dave's Top 10, or the five tallest buildings in the world, or as I'm about to demonstrate, the top five cities I've lived in. Now let's go ahead and create our ordered list. Now I've got my title right here, and underneath that, I'm gonna go ahead and open up our ordered list with the ordered list opening tag. And that's the opening bracket, O, L, then the closing bracket. And I'm going to go ahead and add the closing order list as well. And it's the same as the opening order list, only it begins with the forward slash, just like that. I'm going to put the cursor in there, hit my enter key a couple of times, and give me some room to work. Now inside of the order list, opening and closing tag, you have to have the list items. And they also have an opening and closing tag, and they look like this. As a little pop-up box shows, it's the LI, which should be easy to remember, list item. Like I said, each of those have their opening and closing tag. Now let's go ahead and enter the top five cities that I've lived in. And that's our ordered list. Let me go ahead and back this guy up a little bit. Let's go ahead and save this. Now, as you can see, with an ordered list, the list is presented to you in an ordered fashion. And in this example, numbered. You can also have it set up to where they are delivered to you with Roman numerals or with letters, with uppercase or lowercase. And with HTML5, there is a new attribute that you can use to reverse the order. Let me show you. Now, this is brand new to HTML5, so it may not be supported in all browsers. As a matter of fact, I think it may only be supported in two of them right now. But let's just take a look-see. And frankly, it's a better idea to have all styling done in your CSS and not in line or in your HTML coding. But that's just my two cents worth. Save this and see. Yep, okay, so it works. Now, another styling you can put in here is instead of having it going from numbers, lowest to the highest, or is in this case, highest to the lowest, you can put in the type equals attribute and put in an uppercase A or a lowercase A to have the results shown in uppercase letters or lowercase letters. Uppercase A, save, and we will put this in a lowercase A, save. There you go. Now then the other one that I know of is Roman numerals. Likewise, uppercase or lowercase. That's the uppercase I for the Roman numerals in uppercase. Lowercase I for the lowercase Roman numerals. And again, I want to mention just in closing here that all these stylings that I've been pointing out here should in fact be done in the CSS and not here within the HTML code, but I did want to point out that you will see this done from time to time, but I would suggest doing it in the CSS, even though it does work just fine within the HTML. And that's going to bring to a close this video on ordered lists in your HTML web page. Thanks for watching. You have a great day. This video will show you how to set up an unordered list in your HTML document. Now, first off, what is an unordered list? Well, an unordered list is a list of items without a definite order. A good example of an unordered list is a batch of bullet points on a web page describing the benefits of using the XYZ thingamajig, for example. If that batch of bullet points were, say, the top six reasons you should own the XYZ thingamajig, then it would be an ordered list because of the definite order of that list. 
But since this video is on crafting an unordered list, let's go ahead and check out how to do that in our Komodo editor. And of course you can do this in any editor, I'm just using Komodo in this demonstration. Now, I've already crafted a little bit of our content area here along with the basics of our HTML5 web page. I've got my H2 heading right here. That's what we're looking at here in the demo area. And an unordered list starts off with the UL opening tag, which our opening bracket, UL, and our closing bracket. And the way Komodo is set up here, it automatically inserts the closing bracket. Sometimes that's a bit of a pain, but it'll work for now. I just hit my enter key so that I can get a little working space here. And for the items in our unordered list, we need to have an opening and closing list item tag and that's the opening bracket and as you can see Komodo automatically pulls up the LI tag and if I wanted to use that I just hit my return or enter key and boom it's just like that it's there I just need to close it out and Komodo automatically puts in the closing list item tag and here I put my first list item and you can just go on and on and on and let's go ahead and put in another one here just so I can show you what it looks like whenever we render this in our demo area opening list item tag okay let's go ahead and save this and there it is see how it kind of indents it from the rest of the content and it puts these little round bullet points. Now, there are some additional styling attributes you can add, but in HTML 4.01, those inline styling attributes were deprecated and they're no longer supported in HTML 5. So there's no use in even going over that in this video, but I would suggest any styling that's gonna take place in the HTML area be done in a CSS or cascading style sheet anyway. So if you wanted to add different colors or different shapes or maybe even images instead of the default black round dot, then do so using cascading style sheets or the CSS. I'm just gonna paste this in here to save some time. And basically what I've done is instead of this next line being another list item, I went ahead and added another unordered list opening tag, a few list items, opening and closing tags, and the closing unordered list tag, and then a couple of additional list items for the original unordered list. Let's go ahead and take a look at this. And you see, not only is that second unordered list indented further, but it also has a different looking bullet. Let's go ahead and take a look at this in the Chrome browser. Where are we at here? Let's take a look at this in one more browser. Let's try the Safari browser. But that's it. That's an example of how to set up an unordered list and how you can even add additional unordered lists inside of the unordered list. And that's the end of this video on how to craft your unordered list for your HTML web page. Thanks for watching and you have a great day. This video will introduce you to the HR tag, also known as the horizontal rule tag, and how you can still style it even in HTML5. The HR tag or horizontal rule tag is used when you want to separate sections of your web page with just a simple straight line going from one side of the page to the other. The tag itself is one of those single or empty tags that has the opening and closing all in one tag. Now in older versions of HTML you could add some style to the line by making it a certain width or height and even color and even specify if it were a solid or a dotted line. But since late HTML4 and now in HTML5 that method is no longer supported. Now it is styled in the cascading style sheet and not directly within the HR tag itself. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Me opening up my editor here and this is the Komodo editor and I've already got the line installed right here and this is the tag right here. Now, technically speaking, if you are using an XHTML page, which we are not, this is an HTML5 as shown in the declaration here, then this would have to be shown with a space and then the forward slash. Either way will work, but I'm gonna go this way. And this is how it's demonstrated. Now, how this is actually being shown or interpreted through the browsers is this is a transparent line with a border around it. But that transparent center is so small that the border looks to be solid from top to bottom. So let me demonstrate how that actually is by adding some style. Now up here between the opening and closing style tag, which is located between the opening and closing head tag, we add the selector HR. And you see how Komodo just automatically pops it up here. I could just hit the enter key and we're good. Now then, I want to add a, an opening curly bracket, and then Komodo automatically adds the second or closing curly bracket. 
I've hit my enter key so I got some room to add some stuff. So what I want to do is I want to make the border none. Then I'm going to add a color to the background and I'm going to make the height of the center part even greater so you can see that. Actually, let me add the height first. That way you can see what I'm talking about as far as it being transparent. Let me say five pixels. Now you can see a little bit better. If I make this 15, you probably see even better. There you go. So you can see here, the HR itself is this transparent stuff in the middle, and it actually, by default, has this border around it. So let's go ahead and get rid of that border. Put the separator there. That's the semicolon. Hit my return key. Border, colon, none. The separator or the semicolon. Hit the return key. Because without the border, you're not going to see anything. Because it's there, but it's the same color. It's transparent, so it's the same color as the background. So we need to add some color to that background. And let's go with red. That'll be easy to see. And there you go. And you can do so much more. If you wanted this to be gradient, you could do that with just the styling. If you wanted this to be dotted or dashed, you could do that with the styling. And if you only want it to be a certain width, you could do that as well. Let's say 65% would be a good number. Or you could use pixels, but I would rather go with percentage. That way it could be adjusted according to the window it's being viewed in, whether it's a smartphone or a tablet or a desktop. And there you go. And that's how you can style your HR tag, or otherwise known as the horizontal rule. That's going to bring us to the end of this video. Thanks for watching, and you have a great day. This video is going to cover the validation process of your HTML documents. Validation basically looks for HTML errors and non-standard coding. Most browsers today are pretty forgiving, but some might display your non-standard coded web page all kind of funky. So what I'm going to do here is get this HTML code, and this is an HTML5 document. I'm going to copy this, and we're going to go over to the HTML validator site. That's validator dot w3 dot org and there's three different ways in which we can validate our web page that is by the uri which is actually of the three the best way to do it and that being that your web page is already online on a server somewhere and you simply copy the url or the address paste it in here click on check so if we go to validate by upload if you don't have the file online just choose the file on your computer upload it validate it this way and you can just do it directly here. And this is what I'm going to do here, just do it directly on the website itself. So I'm going to take that code that I just copied into my clipboard, paste it right in here, and click on check. And you get green across the board. Ta-da, we're good to go. Even though this does say this document was successfully checked, and you got the green line here, which means it works, it passed, it does give you the two warnings. Now, if the same exact file were uploaded to a server, then these two warnings would not be there. That's the only difference. Again, it works perfectly as it is, but you do get these little bitty warnings that you would not be getting if it were uploaded and going through a server. Okay, now let me show you how this works by taking one little item out of this code to make it not pass, just to give you an idea as to what it looks like. Okay, so let's go ahead and refresh this. All right, come on back here. Now let me just go ahead and remove this one little closing tag on this paragraph, and let's go ahead and just copy this. That's one of the things I like about the Komodo editor is that if there is a mistake somewhere, it kind of gives you a bit of a visual idea that, hey, there's something wrong with this picture here. Fix this. But let's go ahead and copy this into my clipboard. Come on back to the validator.w3.org site. Go into validate by direct input. Paste that right in here. Click on check. Remember, there was only that one little thing that I did wrong intentionally. Boom, errors found. You're going to get this red dealie up here, and this says 28 errors. What? There was only one thing that I did wrong. On your web page, when you get it validated, it may say, you know, 500 different errors, but there may only be two or three items, two or three small items that once fixed will eliminate a majority, if not all of those errors, and a majority, if not all of those warnings. So let's come on down here and see what they have to say, because they do... They don't leave it for you to guess. They do tell you what to look for as far as fixing the problem. Boom, the very first one, line 19. As a matter of fact, if you look through here, every one of these are going to be on line 19. Come on back to our editor here and guess what's on line 19. Uh-huh. So by taking out that one little bitty character, it affects all these other items below it. 
as shown here with all these different errors. Now then, where are we at here? Right here we go. Now, of course, there's no numbers in here. That would make this even better, is that if this were to have the line numbers, that would be pretty cool. We'll just go ahead and change that, revalidate, and there we go. Again, we saw the two warnings, but again, that's because this was not uploaded through the URI. And that's going to bring us to the end of this video on validating your HTML markup. Thanks for watching, and you have a great day.